This is Land of Havilah, Zechariah 6. This chapter is impossible to understand when read in isolation, but if we understand what Yahweh's already said in the first five chapters of this book, and some of what he said in other books, we can make some good sense of this. Verse 1, Again I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, four chariots came out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass. In the first chariot were red horses, and the second chariot black horses, and th in the third chariot white horses, and in the fourth chariot dappled horses, all of them powerful. Then I asked the angel who talked with me, What are these, my lord? The angel answered me, These are the four winds of the sky which go out from standing before the Lord of all the earth. Comment. This is a continuation of Zechariah's long dream that started in chapter 1. As we'll find out, it'll be on the same subject that Yahweh will gather his people to Jerusalem. They'll come from Israel and all nations. Yahweh and the one called the branch will live there as the glorious king. He'll subjugate the rest of the world because they were his enemies and his people's enemies. Zechariah's contemporaries in Jerusalem are a living sign of it that they've come out of all the nations that were part of the old Babylonian kingdom to establish Yahweh's temple in Jerusalem. The events of their lifetime are a sign of what will happen in the end of time, that God will bring all his believers out of the corrupt Babylonian system and establish them in Jerusalem. He'll be their king, directly present with them. Jerusalem will be wide open and massive with no need of a wall because God will protect it. In verses 1 to 5 of Zechariah 6, we just read, Zechariah saw, Zechariah saw four chariots come out from between two mountains of brass. The horses associated with those chariots were of various colors, all of them powerful. Zechariah's angel, who's been explaining everything to him, doesn't give a full explanation of all the imagery he only says that these four chariots and the horses associated with them are the four winds or four spirits of the sky that go out from standing before the Lord. They're powerful angels, in other words. In popular culture, we picture angels as men, women, and toddlers with wings, but clearly there's nothing human about angels. They do appear in other passages in human form. That's probably the most common way they present themselves, but this passage is a reminder that they're not necessarily anything like humans. They're probably not much like horses or chariots either. They're probably like something beyond our ability to visualize. But for now, as long as we're in these bodies of flesh, we'll have to settle for inexact images. So other than coming out from between two brass mountains, what are these angels doing? Verse 6. The one with the black horses goes out toward the north country, and the white went out after them, and the dappled went out toward the south country. The strong went out and sought to go that they might walk back and forth through the earth. And he said, Go around and through the earth. So they walked back and forth through the earth. Then he called to me and spoke to me, saying, Behold, those who go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. Comment, these angels or agents of God seem to be the strong in verse 6. They went around, through, back, and forth in the whole earth. They saturated it, in other words. They were obviously exercising their power, mentioned in verse 3, and strength, mentioned in verse 7. Since they came out from standing before the Lord, it was a mission from the Lord. And they accomplished what? They quieted Yahweh's spirit in the north country. Also translated, they appeased Yahweh's wrath in the north country. So in today's slang, they performed a smackdown. They delivered God's judgment in the north country. So what's the north country? At the time Zechariah delivered this in the second year of Darius, the officials immediately northward in Samaria were trying to hinder progress on the temple so the north country could be Samaria. But going further back in time, when Nebuchadnezzar attacked Judah, he did it with troops from the nations north of Israel, Jeremiah 25, 9. So it could be that this is the north country, which is due for God's judgment. Jeremiah's ministry was in the days before and during Nebuchadnezzar's attack. Jeremiah said destruction would come from the north, quote, Out of the north evil will break forth on all the inhabitants of the land, Jeremiah 1, 14, end quote. I am bringing evil from the north and a great destruction, Jeremiah 4, 6. This was fulfilled when Nebuchadnezzar attacked, but the, the prophecy might turn out to have double fulfillment due to another attack from the north in the end times. 
And in God's judgment on the north, Jeremiah said, quote, For that day belongs to the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, so as to avenge himself on his foes. For there will be a slaughter for the Lord God of hosts in the land of the north by the river Euphrates, chapter 46, verse 10. So that could be the appeasement of Yahweh's wrath in the north, which could also have double fulfillment when God destroys Israel's enemies in the end times. We know he'll destroy mystery Babylon in the future, Revelation 18.2, and we know that the, the events of Zechariah's generation were a sign of the future, meaning the history of it will repeat itself in some way, Zechariah 3.8, and that all along in Zechariah, the immediate events will have future parallels. Yahweh will say it again in the passage coming up that the events of Zechariah's present will be signs of the future, verse 9. Yahweh's word came to me saying, Take of them of the captivity, even of Helday, of Tobijah, and of Judea, and come the same day and go into the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah, where they've come from Babylon. Yes, take silver and gold and make crowns and set them on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and speak to him, saying, Yahweh of armies says, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build Yahweh's temple. Even he shall build Yahweh's temple, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule on his throne. And he shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. The crown shall be to Helam, and to to Tobijah, and to Judea, and to Hen the son of Zephaniah, for a memorial in Yahweh's temple. Those who are far off shall come and build in Yahweh's temple, and you shall know that Yahweh of armies has sent me to you. This will happen if you will diligently obey Yahweh your God's voice. Comment in verses 9 to 15, Yahweh spoke to Zechariah directly, not through a vision. He said, Make crowns of silver and gold. Put them on the head of Joshua the high priest, then store them in the temple. Speaking of some specific individuals who were probably priests at the time, Yahweh said, Every time they see those crowns in the temple, it will be a sign to them that the man called the branch shall grow up out of this place and build Yahweh's temple. He'll bear the glory of God, he'll rule on his throne, and he and Yahweh will see eye to eye in terms of being counselors or administrators of peace. Those who are far off will come and build Yahweh's temple. This is the only appearance in the scripture of those men just mentioned by name, which to your narrator indicates we should contemplate the Hebrew meaning of their names. Helam means strength. Tobijah means Yahweh is my good. Judea means Yahweh has known. Hen means favor. We could put it all together by saying Yahweh knows us, favors us, is looking out for our good, and will establish all this for us in his strength, including the coming of the branch, which he already has. Now to summarize the first six chapters, which is Zephaniah's long long series of visions in one night, we can put it all together into a single panorama. It all had meaning for the present and double meaning for the future. In chapter 1, repentance was the foundation for participating in all this. Yahweh said he was jealous over Jerusalem to establish his presence there and make it overflow with prosperity. He'll crush his enemy nations. In chapter 2, he tells his people to flee from the land of the north, meaning to separate themselves from the corruption of the earth, and come to his Jerusalem, where he'll, where he'll dwell with them. He says to Israel, Many nations will join you, which speaks of Gentiles fully participating in this Jerusalem of the future. He speaks of that place as his own inheritance. The thought of establishing all this is what makes him tick. He's anxious to get it all done. In chapter 3, Joshua's generation was a sign of things to come that in his generation, Yahweh established Jerusalem suddenly by bringing them out of Babylon. And in the same way, Yahweh will bring out his servant, the branch, and accomplish all this. He'll establish Jerusalem suddenly. There'll be a day when the branch establishes that kingdom in an unprecedented way. We'll sit, each of us, under our vine and fig tree with our neighbors. In chapter 4, Zerubbabel can do anything. A mountain to him is as nothing, which is a sign to us that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, Philippians 4.13.
Zerubbabel and Joshua are olive trees for Israel, providing oil to keep the menorah lit, meaning they provide God's guidance to Israel because of their connection to Yahweh. Every generation hopefully has its fig trees, its leaders that provide guidance from God. In the Great Tribulation, the two witnesses will be the fig trees. For those of us filled with the Spirit, each of us is a fig tree as we minister to those around us. In chapter 5, Yahweh has cursed all thieves and liars and will remove all such wickedness from the land. The wicked won't participate in any of this. In chapter 6, Yahweh will be at rest. His jealousy for his people will be quieted when his agents, the angels, deliver judgment to the lands of the north, which in the future will be mystery Babylon. So it was a busy night for Zechariah in the second year of Darius, 11th month, 24th day, which was February 15th, 519 B.C. Zechariah 7 is next.